Over the last 30 years, as science has evolved, knowledge has evolved, our recommendations regarding screening have evolved as well. Uh, it's not just that the science has changed over time, it's actually that the way that we actually interpret the science has changed over time. Uh, for example, we now have uh, tremendous emphasis on conflicts of interest, both emotional as well as uh, monetary conflicts of interest. Whereas 20 years ago, uh, no group actually worried about conflict of interest. In terms of handling the data and developing of the data, we've had additional clinical trials come out, some that have shown us that screening does not save lives in certain instances. For example, in the early 1960s, everybody thought chest x-ray screening would save lives. Uh, by about 1980, uh, randomized clinical trials had been completed that showed that this was not true. Uh, in the same vein, uh, it was tremendous hope for prostate cancer screening in the early 1990s. Uh, by 1997, the American Cancer Society actually changed its recommendation away from a recommendation for screening and toward a recommendation for informed decision making. And actually, I'm very happy that at least five organizations today in addition to the American Cancer Society, have recommendations for informed decision making regarding prostate cancer screening. I do believe that screening messages have at times in the past been too simplistic from some organizations, including from the American Cancer Society. Uh, they were simplistic and appropriate at one time. As science evolved, we had to uh, make those messages more complicated. And unfortunately, many people today have difficulty understanding the complexity of the message. Well, you know, I uh, wrote a paper not too long ago where I actually uh, put a quote uh, in it that said that sometimes it's uh, very difficult to understand when not understanding is important to making your income. Uh, to that extent, there are some financial interests in screening that uh, unfortunately push screening when we really ought to push science and push what science says. I think most people who are what I will call too pro-screening are folks who actually want to do the right thing and folks who actually are interested in saving lives. Uh, I, re I actually think that emotional concerns about the devastation of cancer are what drive most people to push screening, even at times when they push screening and I think perhaps they're over pushing it. And by the way, I will say that many of us are very concerned about hospitals and certain organizations that actually have buses that go to malls and go to shopping centers to do free prostate cancer screening without any discussion of the known risks of prostate cancer screening. And uh, you are correct um, when you say some people do it for money. I actually, in my book, uh, which was published earlier this year, did write a story about a marketing guy who actually told me about his hospital's business plan for how they could make money off of prostate cancer screening. So yes, there is some money making in it, but I think most people who promote prostate cancer screening simply do not understand the complexity and do not understand that we can actually document how many people are harmed because of prostate cancer screening far better than we can document how many people are helped by prostate cancer screening. There are five other organizations in prostate cancer that have all recommended informed decision making. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force statement actually is, if you read the whole statement, that they recommend against screening, but they realize that some men will want screening and some doctors will want to do it despite the evidence, and in that case, men should be informed of the known risks and the possible benefits, and men should understand that before they submit to screening. This is actually very, very similar 
to uh, screening recommendations from other organizations, be it the American Cancer Society or even the American Urological Association. Indeed, the American Urological Association recommendation is one that I wholeheartedly endorse. And it is given the uncertainty that PSA testing results in more benefit than harm, a thoughtful and broad approach to PSA is critical. Patients need to be informed of the risks and benefits of testing before it is undertaken. And so we're all about informed decision making and informed consent. And if there actually has been a problem over the last 20 years, it's that a large number of men have been screened without being adequately informed when all of these organizations in their printed literature say that men need to be told of the known proven risks and the possible benefits before they get screened. In the case of uh, breast cancer screening, uh, the American Cancer Society for now more than 15 years has recommended an annual mammogram beginning at the age of 40 with a high quality mammogram and a clinical breast exam for women. The second paragraph is that women need to be informed of the limitations of mammography. They need to be informed that um, mammography will miss some cancers that we wish we found. Mammography will find some masses that cause them to be worked up over a period of time. Uh, scare some women that they may have breast cancer and they find out they don't have breast cancer. We've even published in our guideline that of a thousand women screened age 40 over a 10 year period of time, there'll be about 650 callbacks because of an abnormality and there's going to be about nine cancers ultimately diagnosed. So we are for good high quality screening for women annually beginning at the age of 40 and that good High quality screening includes a mammogram as well as a clinical breast exam, but we also believe women need to be told of the limitations of screening at all ages. Uh, now, my interpretation of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is that they do recommend against screening for women in their 40s. However, they go on to say that women in their their 40s who are very concerned about breast cancer because of a family history or because of just a tremendous concern for breast cancer uh, should consider getting mammography. So even the task force uh, I think has been uh, harshly criticized for uh, saying women shouldn't get screened in their 40s when in reality their statement doesn't fully say that. The American Cancer Society's uh, recommendation for cervical cancer screening uh, is actually very similar to the recommendation of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. There was a dramatic shift around 2001-2002 where organizations like ACS and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology stopped recommending that all women get annual pap smears and started recommending that women who had a um, series of three normal pap smears could actually go to screening every three years. Now that actually is based on some science that had been published. It basically demonstrated that of the 4,000 or so women who die of cervical cancer every year in the United States, if you actually go back and look into their medical records, the majority of them had never had a pap smear in their lifetime prior to the diagnosis of cervical cancer. And those who did, 90 plus percent of them had not had a pap smear uh, in greater than 10 years. And so what we actually have in the United States is a group of people who are getting pap smears every year who really don't need them and a disparate population that really needs to get pap smears that actually uh, generally never gets them at all. In September of 2011, the American Cancer Society published an interim guideline on uh, screening for lung cancer. This guideline was published as an interim guideline because we felt the need to get information out to the public quickly. We have our, uh, a group of experts that are reviewing the literature and will ultimately come out with a guideline later this year, or early next year, that will be our permanent guideline. Our interim guideline in effect right now is that uh, 
people who would have qualified for the National Cancer Institute Lung Cancer Screening Trial, meaning that they were age 55 or over, had a greater than 30 pack year history of smoking, had stopped smoking, if they had stopped smoking, they stopped smoking within the last 15 years. Uh, those people should consider lung cancer screening. It's our belief that the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial is uh, one of the best screening studies ever done. It's one of the best studies ever done because it showed us uh, a relative risk reduction of 20% in terms of deaths, but it also showed us the harms of screening. Uh, we also at the ACS are moving away from talking about relative risk and talking more about absolutes. In that trial, uh, 26,000 people screened with spiral CT uh, three times over a two-year period of time. The end result was 10 years later. There were 84 less deaths among those 26,000 people. It's important to realize that there were still over 340 of the 26,000 who died from lung cancer, but there were 84 deaths that were uh, averted, lung cancer deaths averted, or people saved from a lung cancer death. At the, at the same time that it saved 84 people, uh, if you look at that New England Journal of Medicine article, it actually notes that 16 individuals died within 30 days of uh, getting a procedure related to the screening. In other words, there's the argument that while it saved 84 lives, it actually cost the lives of 16. And in that article, six of the 16 did not have cancer ultimately on autopsy. So we see, we see lung cancer screening as we see many screening tests. It is a double-edged sword where there is a benefit and there is a harm. And we believe that people who qualified for that trial actually should um, think about that benefit and that harm, and if they want to get screened, we support their getting screened. If they don't want to get screened, we support their not getting screened. We believe there should not be any economic uh, disincentive to someone who wants to get screened. In other words, I do believe that insurance should pay for the screening. I actually have tremendous hope, by the way, for lung cancer screening. At the same time, I don't want to use lung cancer screening to encourage people to continue smoking. I would like folks who are interested in lung cancer screening to work very hard to try to stop smoking while I respect that it is very difficult to stop smoking.